In July 2016, one of the world's busiest shipping lanes ground to a halt. A 400-metre container ship, the CMA CGM Vasco da Gama, stopped dead in the water, mid-transit through the Suez Canal. Engines silent, tugboats rushing to respond, dozens of vessels stacked behind her, each minute compounding the pressure, both operational and economic. The engine had overheated. But that failure didn't start in the engine room. It started outside the hull because ships don't cool themselves from within. They survive by pulling the ocean into their own body. That's right. While every other part of a ship is designed to keep water out, there's one system that does the opposite. A system that draws in seawater and sends it back out to the ocean. Quietly, constantly, like a human breathing in and out. You can't see it from the deck. You won't hear it on the bridge. But without it, generators would overheat, engines would seize, and firefighting systems would run dry. And the largest vessels would become underwater tombs. This system doesn't begin with pumps or filters. It starts deeper, beneath the water line with a recessed opening in the hull, quietly facing the sea. Everything from cooling water to fire protection depends on it. It's called a sea chest. The sea chest is simple in appearance, just a recessed chamber built into the side or bottom of the hull, below the waterline. From the outside, it looks like a barred opening, nothing more. But step into the engine room and its importance becomes immediately clear. Seawater flows in through this chamber and is routed into pumps, through filters to cooling circuits that snake throughout the vessel. It cools the main engines, feeds the generators, supplies the firefighting system and supports flushing systems, bearing coolers and even deck washers. In many ships, the ballast system also draws from this source. It's not just an intake, it's a lifeline. But drawing water from the ocean is never simple because seawater is never still. And turbulent flow, water twisting and swirling instead of moving smoothly, can turn this lifeline into a liability. So, how do you stop bubbles, debris or erratic flow from reaching the pumps? The answer lies in the design. When a ship cuts through the water, or even when it just rests at anchorage, there's always pressure acting on its hull. So when you cut a hole in that hull, why doesn't the ship flood? Because water enters a sea chest not by accident, but by physics. Even if the ship is perfectly still, seawater still flows in. That's hydrostatic pressure, the force from the sheer weight of the water above. The deeper the intake sits below the surface, the more pressure it feels. If you've ever felt your ears pop just a few metres underwater, that's hydrostatic pressure. We can even calculate it. P equals rho times g times h. Where P equals the pressure at depth in pascals, rho equals the density of the fluid, for seawater, that's about 1,025 kilograms per meter cubed. G is the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. And H is the depth below the water surface in meters. So let's say the sea chest is located two meters below the waterline. Plug a sea chest just two meters below the surface into the formula, and you're looking at around 20 kilopascals, enough to drive water into the system with no pumps required. Even when a ship's at anchor, the ocean does the work. That's why sea chests are often located as low as practical. Deeper means a more reliable intake, but go too deep, and the hull has to be reinforced to survive the added pressure. And it gets trickier, because when a ship starts moving forward, a second force comes into play. Dynamic pressure, created by the motion itself. To understand this, imagine sticking your hand out of a parked car. Nothing. Now, do the same at 80 km per hour. The air slams into your palm. The faster the car goes, the harder that push becomes. That's dynamic pressure created by motion through air. The same thing happens when a ship moves through the ocean. The hull slices and forces its way through the water. Water sweeps across the surface, and when it meets the opening of a sea chest, some of it gets pushed inside. The pressure from motion is sometimes called the ram effect. But it's not just brute force, it's fluid dynamics. Bernoulli's principle tells us that in a fluid like water, when the speed of the flow increases, the pressure drops and vice versa. So, as fast moving seawater hits the opening of the sea chest and slows down, pressure increases at the inlet. That pressure rise helps drive water inward. 
But that water flow around the hull isn't uniform. If water is moving too fast across the hull, or if the sea chest is placed in the wrong spot, it can draw in bubbles, debris, or even air. But what if the ship isn't sitting deep in the water? A low-placed intake might seem ideal, until the ship is riding light. In that case, it may not be submerged at all, risking suction loss and air ingress. That's why many vessels are designed with two sea chests. One high, one low. When the ship is heavily loaded and sits deep in the water, the lower chest does the job efficiently. But when the vessel is lightly loaded, trimmed forward or pitching through heavy seas, the upper intake takes over, ensuring the flow of seawater remains uninterrupted. It's not just about where you put the intake, it's about making sure at least one of them always works. And depth isn't the only important factor. There's a reason they're shaped the way they are too. Every episode on this channel takes days to produce, from research and scripting to storyboarding, animation and even voiceover. And it's all made possible by our Patreon crew. We've just revamped our Patreon and we've prepared a lot more to share with you. As a deckhand, you'll get early ad-free access to new videos, be able to vote on upcoming video topics, grab exclusive wallpapers for your phone and PC, and see your name on our supporters wall at the end of every new video. If you'd like a closer look behind the scenes, the officer tier gives you time lapses of our team working hard on brand new animations or thumbnails. You'll also get behind the scenes updates, animatic releases, and a monthly newsletter filled with maritime stories and news that we don't cover on the channel. And for those who really want to take the helm, our captain tier lets you sail your very own custom designed ship in the casual navigation art style, featured in a future episode for everyone to see. You'll also get your name in the end credits as a captain supporter with video shoutouts and private Q&A sessions on Discord. However you choose to support, or even if you're just here watching, it truly means a lot. You'll find the Patreon link down below. Thank you for keeping casual navigation afloat. Most sea chests are either rectangular or cylindrical, but their shape isn't arbitrary. Because in fluid dynamics, flow doesn't just care about how big the opening is, it cares about how that opening is shaped. Sharp corners or abrupt transitions can cause turbulence, create swirling eddies or even trap air pockets. And that's bad news for pumps and filters downstream. To avoid this, naval architects round the edges, smooth the lips and sometimes bevel the intake walls. A well-shaped sea chest allows water in gently minimizing flow separation and keeping the stream steady and laminar. That means less resistance, more reliable intake, and fewer problems for the systems that depend on it. Flow rate. The amount of water entering the sea chest per second is governed by the formula flow rate Q equals area A times velocity V, where Q is flow rate in cubic meters per second, A is the cross-sectional area of the opening, and V is the velocity of water entering the chest. So yes, larger area means higher flow rate, but that only works if the shape encourages stable velocity. Too narrow, the velocity spikes, increasing friction losses. Some designs add internal baffles, panels that redirect water with veins which are thin, fin-like surfaces that guide the flow smoothly, much like fan blades steering air. Others use gratings or strainers with carefully spaced bars, strong enough to block debris, but not so tight that they choke the intake. So, the size is right, the shape is tuned, and the depth is optimal. But one question remains. Where on the hull do you put it? Even a perfectly designed sea chest is useless if it's placed in the wrong flow. Water doesn't move the same way across every part of the hull. As the ship pushes forward, a thin layer of water clings to its surface, slowing down, swirling and thickening. This is the boundary layer, and inside it, the flow becomes unpredictable. Place a sea chest too far aft, and you're deep in this turbulent soup. Instead of a smooth, steady intake, you get chaotic eddies and air bubbles. Rough seas can make it worse, triggering cavitation. Tiny vapour bubbles that collapse violently, hammering the metal with microscopic shockwaves. Over time, that means erosion. Move too far forward, and you face the opposite problem. 
Water may be moving so fast that it skims right past the intake before it can enter. The flow isn't just fast, it's unstable and prone to separation. That's why designers aim for a sweet spot. Not too close to the bow, not buried in the stern wash, but somewhere along the midbody in a region of stable flow. Flow, however, isn't the only factor. Redundancy matters too. Many large vessels use twin sea chests, one on each side of the hull. If the ship lists or trims, or if marine growth blocks one intake, the other keeps working. One may sit slightly higher, the other lower, ensuring that no matter the loading condition, at least one always remains submerged. Because in ship design, failure isn't just inconvenient, it's catastrophic. Now, shape and position might be perfect, but the ocean does not care. Because outside the hull, on the grates of every sea chest, is the wild. Ropes, seaweed, plastic bags, algae, mussels, anything in the water, natural or not, wants to settle right there. And over time, it does. This is fouling. It doesn't happen all at once. Layer by layer, growth and debris build up narrowing the openings and choking the flow. This can happen in the wrong moment, mid-transit, mid-mission. That's what's happened with the Vasco da Gama. The water stopped, the engine overheated, tugboats scrambled, and traffic in one of the busiest shipping lanes halted, billions delayed. On the hull, the sea chest sits in constant contact with the ocean, taking everything the water throws at it. For engineers, protecting a sea chest is never about a single fix. It's in layers, each one standing guard against a different enemy. It starts at the hull, where thick steel gratings are welded across the opening. These are the bouncers of the system, stopping the big troublemakers before they ever get inside. Fishing nets, drifting ropes, chunks of timber, anything large enough to block a pipe in one hit. Past the bars, the second line waits. Strainers. These mesh baskets sit just inside the piping, catching smaller threats the grates let through. Shredded plastic, clumps of algae, seashell fragments, even jellyfish pooled in by the flow. But not everything arrives as debris. Some threats grow there, slowly. Marine fouling. Barnacles, mussels, sticky biofilm can quietly choke an intake until the flow rate drops by half in a matter of weeks. So ships fight back with anti-fouling systems. Copper anodes that release ions to poison growth, chlorine dosing to kill what's incoming, or ultrasonic pulses that shatter larvae before they even settle. In polar waters, the challenge shifts. Here, the enemy isn't growth, it's ice. If seawater freezes in the chest or the piping, flow stops instantly. Pumps lose suction, cooling systems fail, and to prevent that, Arctic vessels heat their sea chests with live steam, warm water coils, or a constant trickle of engine water to keep temperatures safely above freezing. And then there's combat. For warships, a fouled or noisy intake can be as dangerous as enemy fire. They run redundant chests on each side of the hull, cross-connected by valves, routed through baffled chambers that strip out debris without giving away sound. Even their shapes are tuned to reduce sonar return. Because no matter the mission, cargo, icebreaking or combat, every sea chest eventually faces the same truth. The ocean never stops trying to take it back. Which is why the final defence isn't mechanical at all. Crews send divers down for underwater inspections, clearing debris and checking for damage while the ship is still afloat. And when time or damage demands more, the vessel goes to dry dock, lifted from the sea so every grate and every weld of the intake can be cleaned, repaired or replaced before it sets sail again. From grates to anti-fouling tech, each layer defends the sea chest in its own way. But none of them can see the problem coming. They only react once it's already there. But today, it's getting smarter. Modern sea chests are monitored in real time. Not just for pressure, but for flow velocity, temperature and even vibration. A drop in pressure might not mean failure. It might mean a plastic bag just brushed across the grate. But the system notices. And if it lingers, the ship knows.